Well, if you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to backtrack just a little bit so we can pick up some things that I think we don't want to miss in this Genesis study. Beginning at verse 4, this is the history or the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now the reason I wanted to go back because there's a transition that happens here in verse number 4 of Genesis chapter 2. In the other verses in chapter 1 and in chapter 2 until verse 4, we see the name that is associated with God just as God. And now we see for the first time in Genesis another association with God in the Bible. And it is the phrase, Lord God. So until this uh, verse, it's always been God. And now it is Lord God. So in chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, we find the term God, which in the Hebrew is the word Elohim. And Elohim is the plural form of the ancient word El or Eloah, which is the ancient name of God. But Elohim is the plural form used in a singular context. Now that sounds uh, very odd that it's a plural form used in a singular context. But it gives us a revelation of who God is. Now when I say a plural form used in a singular way, Let's go back and look how that actually sounds. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, it says, On the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Now I've emphasized the words his and he because if we say Elohim, and that's the word here, on the seventh day Elohim ended his work, But yet the word Elohim is in a plural form, but yet it's used in a singular way. And you say, okay, why do you keep emphasizing this? It's a plural form used in a singular way. Well, we know that God has manifested and revealed himself to to us as what? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But yet there's not three gods. There's just one God. But yet the Elohim is in a plural form, but it's used in a singular way. Hence the, the, the term and the, the pronouns here. God ended his work. Now, if it was truly plural in a plurality, it would read different, wouldn't it? It would say that they ended their work, which they had done, and they rested on the seventh day from uh, their work, which they had done. But that's not the way it reads. It reads, his work, which he had done, he rested from all his work, which he had done. So it gives us an indication of the plurality of God, but also the singularity of God. There is only one God. It also is uh, found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So there again... It is the word in the Hebrew Elohim, but it's used in a singular form or a singular way. So in chapter 2 of of, uh, verse 4, we see God Elohim referred to as the Lord God. So we have this addition to Elohim, and it's the word that we know as Lord. But in the Hebrew, it is the word that we know as Yehovah, or Jehovah, but yet in Hebrew it's not pronounced with a J, it's a Y, Jehovah, and then Jehovah God, Jehovah Elohim. Now, Jehovah or Jehovah, by definition, means the existing one, or self-existent, or eternal. And that's another indication of who God is, and we see this in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses says, Who will I say sent me? And the Lord said, I am that I am, or I am the existing one. And as far as we know about God, he has always been, he is, and he shall be. And the scriptures reveal to us that he dwells in the past and the present and the future all at the same time. Now, my little brain can't wrap around that, but I do know that's what the Word of God says. He is the God who was who is, 
and who is to come, which means he dwells in the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. Well, I'll tell you what, that'll sizzle your brain just a little bit, and, and mine does sizzle on that. But you know, that's the nature of God. He's so far beyond us, and he is the existing one, self-existent and eternal. Now, it's interesting that the, the first um, line in your Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's what it is in English. But in Hebrew, it is a different cadence, and it's different words. Obviously, it's Hebrew words. In English, we write from the left to the right. In Hebrew, it's from the right to the left. So it's a little different. And so the first line in our Bible in Hebrew consists of seven words, which is the number of God. So seven is the number of God, and the number of God seven words of the Bible. And I'm going to butcher this, but I'll give it to you anyway. This is the seven Hebrew words that appear, as we know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et, hashemayim, have. So those are the seven words in Hebrew that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, it's a little bit different, you know, in Hebrew, but those seven words give us the beginning of what we know is Genesis. Now the Genesis account in chapter 1 gives us insight and revelation as to the beginning of all things in our world, uh, not in detail but in panoramic view. So we, we have chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and it begins with what we know as the beginning of the creation of the heavens and the earth, the creation of all of the things that we know as far as the atmosphere, the land, the seas, the grass, herbs, trees, the water creatures, the birds, land animals, and then man. So chapter 2 gives us more details about that generalization of creation there in chapter 1. So chapter 2 gives us a little bit more details. Now here's some of the details in chapter 2. The earth was watered not by rain, but the earth was watered by mist that rose from the earth itself. We know that God formed man out of the dust of the earth and that Eve was created from the side of man and out of man. We know that God breathed into man and he became a living soul. Um, I heard someone teach on this because this area of soul is kind of hard for us to grasp. We know a lot about the body, and we said that God is in some way a plurality, and so are you. Your body, your soul, and your spirit. And someone was saying, well, how would you find the soul, or how would you define the soul? And someone, and I thought it was a good illustration, said, the soul is like the music inside the organ. You can tear it apart and try to find it, but you may not see it, but yet it's there when it's played. So as the air is going through the reeds of the organ, you have music, but if you tear the organ apart to try to find the music, guess what? You won't see it, but you know it when you hear it. How many of you got that? And I thought, that's a great illustration because we do have a soul, and God breathed into mankind, and we became a living soul. We know that God planted a garden. We call it the Garden of Eden, and there he placed the man there, and he placed the man there to tend and to work in the garden. Now, the importance of Genesis is to give us a foundation of what we believe and who we believe in, and we're referring back to the Lord God, or uh, Jehovah Elohim, the uh, self-existence, the one who's eternal, and we we believe that uh, we have that revelation of creation, obviously through him, and so we wouldn't know the beginning unless God revealed the beginning, right? So we have that uh, revelation of God. And someone said, if you believe the Genesis account, then you get rid of all of the isms in your life. Now, let me clarify that. How could we get rid of some of the isms if we believe what Genesis says. 
Well, we would get rid of atheism because atheism believes that there is no God. But Genesis says what? There is a God. We would get rid of agnosticism because agnostics don't really know if there's a God. But Genesis tells us that there is a God. We would get rid of polytheism because polytheism is a belief in multiple or many gods, and we know that there is only one God. We would get rid of deism, and deism is that there is a creator who made all the things that we know, but that creator does not interact or intervene in its creation, and we know in Genesis that's absolutely not true. We would take care of humanism because humanism puts a higher value on man and the importance of the person in the ethical treatment of people without a belief in God. We would count out Buddhism because Buddhism has no creation account. Buddhists just believe the world was always here. We would get rid of Hinduism. There's a lot of isms in the world, isn't there? Hinduism. They believe that Brahma, who has four heads, sprang from a cosmic golden egg, created good and evil, light and darkness, and then created all the animals. So we would get rid of uh, Hinduism. We would get rid of Jainism, believes that the universe and all that's in it has always existed. We would count out Mormonism because Joseph Smith, founder of Mormons, taught that all matter is eternal without beginning or end. Therefore, the earth was not created by God, but merely organized from existing elements. Joseph Smith also claimed that Elohim, our heavenly father, was the supervisor of creation and that Jehovah or Jesus, together with many other helpers from the spirit kingdom, organized the existing elements in the Adamic world. And that's confusing to me whenever I just read it. So there's a lot of isms. Uh, Taoisms believe that there is no God who controls the cosmos and the universe sprang up from the Tao, which means the path or the order. Uh, Confucianism has no creation story. And I, I've saved kind of the best for last because you see this in uh, the news and Hollywood stars who are into Scientology. Uh, we could name some stars that are believers in Scientology. And so let me give you the creation story of Scientology. So hold on to your pew and, and we're going to get it here. According to Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, Zinyu, the dictator of the Galactic Confederacy, brought billions of his people to Earth, then known as uh, Tigiak, in a spacecraft 75 million years ago, stacked them around volcanoes, and killed them with hydrogen bombs. Official Scientology scripture holds that the Theotans are the immortal spirits of these aliens then adhered to humans, and that's how we got here. Well, that simplifies it for me. How about you? So whenever you hear people say, well, it's hard for me to believe in the Genesis story, goodness gracious, it's even worse when I hear their story because it's absolutely sometimes ridiculous. So this is the way Genesis begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we did this the very first time that we taught on this and getting back to Hebrew, which the Bible is written in, that the Jews or the Hebrews wrote from right to left, and the first word of Bereshit, which means beginning, is the, the letter Bet, and the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Alpha, and the second one is Bet, and so where do we get from that? The Alpha Bet, so that first symbol looks like this, and so the Hebrew scholars said, as God began to say beginning, he wrote it from this direction, and because of the symbol looking like this, we, we go into this and we get blocked off. And so we can't see anything beyond that, so we just have to take the revelation that we have, and so we know nothing beyond what God has revealed to us. 
which is very interesting for us to really ascertain and, and, and ponder on because we have all kind of questions. Well, where did God come from? Or what did God make the universe from or the cosmos from? And the Bible says he just spoke it into existence. And beyond what God said in his holy word, then we really don't know anything else. It's just the revelation that we have. So in Genesis, we find you know, certain things, and we're going to progress through this. Uh, you know, we, we could be on this for two or three years because it is so interesting and really so deep. So we find here in Genesis that, that man has a need to work. And so if you ask most men, when you get to dialogue with them and you say, well, tell me about yourself, and a lot of times we men will first begin to tell you what we do. Very common. And I've done that. Well, tell me about yourself. And then we tell people what we do. And I think it's a little innate in, in us because God put us, the first man, in the garden. And he said, you need to tend and work this garden. So before he had a wife, before he had anything else, what did he have? He had what we might say is a job or a vocation or a calling or a mandate from God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God uh, Jehovah Elohim took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So to, to take the first command of God or the first statement of God to mankind, and it would be this, to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue, to have dominion over the earth. So to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue, to have dominion may take some effort, you think? And so he says to mankind, um, it's going to take some effort or some work to do what I've called you to do. So God's desire was for us to be busy. He, he had a mandate. He had a job for us. He had something for us to do. And I've also found that this out just in personal observation, that when we as men do not work or we don't have a purpose, then we're really not very happy. And... Uh, I was uh, listening to someone the other day, and I, I'd never thought about this, but they were discussing uh, post, uh, you know, stress syndrome, PTSD, and a lot of the military and people who've been engaged in different areas of life um, have some PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And one of the military doctors, and I heard this uh, comment, had made an observation of studying men and women who came back from the com combat zone. And years ago, we didn't call it PTSD. We called it being shell-shocked or, you know, other things. And they, they thought one of the things that happened with men and women coming back that really caused them problems where they were trained and they were called to duty and then they were sent out to a purpose. So I want you to think about this, and we have people in the military even here tonight and veterans in the military. So you're trained extensively. You are given a duty to perform, and you're sent out for purpose. So during that deployment, during the war, during your time of duty, then you are there completing the purpose. Then when you come back from that tour of duty or that deployment, you still have the sense of duty, but now the purpose has drastically changed. So many of the doctors there in the military believe that that duty is still there, but the purpose has changed so much, it caused some emotional reaction to that. And I thought, you know, I've never, ever thought of that, but it does make some sense. And so mankind, we have been sent out to a purpose and a duty to perform by God. And we are most, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, acceptable and happy and content when we're doing the things that God wants us to do. So one of the things that we see in the book of Genesis in chapter 2 is God's desire to keep us from knowing good and evil. Because everything that Adam and Eve know at this point is all good, right? They don't know anything about evil. 
And when I think about this, it's kind of what we do with our kids, isn't it? You know, I, I have boys, and now my boys are having grandkids, and uh, some way they're a lot better than they were. But uh, I'm just kidding you, kind of. But you, you kind of want to shelter your kids and your grandkids from the world that's evil. That's why we don't let them watch certain shows, right? That's why we don't want to have them around certain people because there is this good and evil that we'd like to have this purity or this uh, innocence in our world and in our kids and our children. But we don't live in a world that is just all good. We live in a world that has good and evil. And it seems like God wanted to keep his kids from the evil part of the world. And so he said, don't eat of this tree. Now, the Lord told Adam and Eve, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but only one that you're to be kept from. And it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were having access to the tree of life. And we don't know if Adam and Eve, uh, you know, had to eat from that tree of life to sustain life because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And at this point, there has been no sin. So there is no death. They, they didn't know what death was. I mean, the animals didn't die. Uh, the plants, you know, didn't know death. Nothing knew death. But once they transgressed the commandment of God and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they transgressed the command of God, and the Bible says death entered into the world. And from that point, they began to die. Now, they didn't just fall over dead at the moment they ate. But they did begin to die once they ate and transgressed the commandment of God. And now, not only did Adam and Eve fall into sin, but all of the world fell with them. Now, most of you know this. In Romans chapter 8, there's a portion talking about the coming of the Lord and the new creation. And the Bible says that creation today is groaning waiting for the sons of God or the sons of men or the people of God to be restored back to the way that they should have been at the beginning. Now, why is creation groaning and wanting us to be back to the way that God wants us to be? Because creation knows that there was a time that there was no death in creation, there was no fall of creation until the fall of mankind. And so when mankind is restored back to where we should be, and that's only through Jesus Christ and what he's done, then creation will also come back to the place that it was. And that's why in Romans 8 it says creation is groaning, waiting for it to be put back to the way it was. Very interesting, very interesting. So look at, with me, verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in, in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. And they did begin to die. Now, we know Adam lived over 900 years. That's a long time, 900 years. But they were so close to that original, creative sinless time that it took a while for them to die and not only them but the generations that came after them they lived hundreds of years it was only until the time of the flood that God shortened the lifespan of mankind now the Bible tells us why he did that he said my spirit shall not always strive with man so what is God saying Fallen mankind, I've tried to get them back to a relationship with me, and I've dealt with them for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, 500 years, 600 years, and he said, I'm going to shorten their lifespan, and so he, he takes it a little over 100 years after that. And, of course, throughout the ages until really uh, the, the modern day that we live in, the lifespan has been fairly short until the 1900s and, you know, the uh, advent of technology and medicines and the, uh, the increase of science, 
then our lifespan has now increased some, but nothing like the time of Adam and, and Abraham and, and Noah and Methuselah, who is the longest living recorded person we have ever had. What is it, 969 years that he lived? Um, now, if you think about this, and I just want to throw this in tonight because sometimes we don't think about it. If you had been, you know, 10 generations uh, past Adam, and one of the grandkids said, uh, Grandpa, tell me what it was like. You know, I hear these stories about Adam and Eve and creation and, and all the things that happened in the Garden of Eden. Can you tell me the story? And Grandpa may have said this, well, Adam still lives down here on First Street. Why don't you go ask him? Because when you go back and research this, even after generations after generations, and if you calculate it out numerically, Adam was still alive through a whole lot of this. And uh, you, you could have found some type of reference from the man himself. Now let me fast forward until the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection and the ascension. So when Paul writes into the Corinthian church, and he is telling about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and says that he is resurrected and he's alive, then he's telling those Corinthians, if you don't believe me, Jesus appeared to hundreds of witnesses after his resurrection, and many of them are still alive to this day. So if you want to know what it was like when that happened, there's people you can go talk to. Now, for a lot of the people here tonight, and, uh, and for some of us, uh, many of you don't know what it was like to be alive when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, you don't know what it was like to watch the live newscast or Walter Cronkite coming and breaking in on the news or seeing the images of the funeral or any of those things. But there's several of us here tonight, we were alive when those things happened. And I can remember where I was when the news broke and uh, the reaction of the people around me. Uh, I was uh, a lot younger then, but I, I still remember the day. I remember where I was. I remember the reaction of people around me. Now, many of you, you can't, you know, get your head around that because you weren't even born then. And so you have to understand they lived a very long time. And they had access to many, not only stories and accounts, but the people who actually uh, lived it and was in it. And so much of this passed on uh, through personal accounts. So mankind's role, we see it develop in the book of Genesis. We all see the order that is developed in the book of Genesis. We live in a world today that's trying to have an upheaval of the order of God. I think, would anybody agree with that? That we have come to a time in human history that man thinks that they know better than God. And so the order of God is given here. So the first thing I want to point out here is Adam was to have a relationship with the animals that were created beneath him in lower order. Now, the reason I say that is that Adam is the crown of creation as far as a human created the last day of creation, day six. He's also given the task and the duty to name the animals. God did not name the animals. Adam did. Now, I tried to think of something that maybe we could identify with this as far as an order and a privilege and an authority Kids don't name themselves. Now, some do later, but who names the children? The parents do. I remember when Aaron was born, Carrie and I kind of batted around for about a day and a half what we're going to name this kid. We were still uncertain even after he was born. And we're getting ready to leave the hospital. And I said, honey, we've got to name this boy before we leave. We've got to get the birth certificate uh, you know, filled out. So you know, we, we put the name on him. And then, of course, Matthew comes along, and we, we put his name on him. And so now here Adam is, and he has all these animals, and then God commissioned Adam to name the animals. So it shows a couple of things. 
The animals are created for man and under man, and mankind, or Adam, named the animals. Today, we see a lot of people getting those things out of kilter. Um, I'm an animal lover. We should respect animals. We should not ill-treat animals. We should uh, uh, do everything we can take care of them. I think you would agree with that. But some of the same people who would be out here in direct defiance of anyone misusing or mistreating an animal and, and you know, harping on animal rights would have no problem with the abortion of babies. That's the world we live in today. They would value the life of the animal higher than the life of a child. And I know some that seem like they treat their animals better than they do their own kids. So we've got some of the upside-down world going on today, and I'm certainly not you know, for any mistreatment of animals. But yet we have to understand that animals are not on the same level as a human. And they are for our service and for uh, us to use. Uh, We know in the role and the order that he was to have a relationship with Eve beside him. Not under him, not over him, but alongside of him. Equal in value, equal in worth. They have different positions, but they are equal. And then they're to have a relationship with God who is over them. Now I want you to think about this. So there's three different levels of relationship. The world that they are to have dominion over, so they're over the plant and animal world, but then there is this human relationship they have horizontal alongside of, but then there's another relationship that is above them that we have a vertical relationship. So it's relationships under mankind, equal with mankind, and then above mankind, Almighty God. And so when we keep those relationships in order, the world goes a lot better. When we get them out of order, it upsets the order of God and the order of the the universe. So look with me to chapter 2 again, and and we're going to end tonight on um, an area that I think you'll find interesting, and a lot of this is... uh, conjecture but it's very interesting because the bible talks about it verse 10 a river flowed out of eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers the name of the first is pison pishon the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold and the gold of that land is good uh, bedellum and onyx stone are there the name of the second river is the Gihon, and the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now the last two we can identify fairly well. And I'm sure some of you have been maybe in that same region, the Tigris, the Euphrates, which is in the land of Iraq, and of course right to the east is Iran. And so we know that those rivers flow into the Persian Gulf, and they're still there today. Now, the other two, a little bit more difficult to identify. So I want to make this statement, and I want to tell you that the world that we have today is so much different than the world that was at the time of creation. Not only because of the fall, but because of some changes geographically in the world. Now, I have some maps or some pictures that we're going to put up here to kind of get us a reference. So you you see the Middle East, you see the Arabian Peninsula, and if you look up to the left, there is a green and a blue line, which is the Tigris on the right, or the green Euphrates on the left, which is the blue, and you see them um, flowing into the Persian Gulf. Now, the Bible says that the source of the waters was where? The Garden of Eden. And there was one river that flowed from the garden that branched off into these four different rivers. If you look to the left, there is a green line, 
And it's kind of hard to see on the slide, but it's the Gihon. And it appears from this map to flow from the region of uh, Eastern Asia Minor down through um, what we would call Lebanon and uh, Israel uh, across into uh, Egypt and follow the course of the Nile River and then flow down into Ethiopia and branch off into two areas off the Horn of Africa. Everybody see that one? And then there's the yellow line, which is the Pison, or uh, it's pronounced a little bit different in the Hebrew. And you see that same yellow coming from that same stream, which would be up toward the top, going across the Arabian Peninsula and then going over into the Persian Gulf. Now, is that the four rivers? Well, we know that's the four names. Is that the location? We're not for sure. Then we have another slide that shows something just a little bit different. And there are four red lines that come off of this. So we start again up in the eastern part of Asia Minor. So we see the lines that go off the Tigris-Euphrates. Then we see the one that goes down through the middle of Israel and empties out along the edge of the Red Sea today. Then the other one goes a little bit further to the east and goes through what we would see as the channel of the Nile River. And we do know the, the land that is called Cush, you see that down at the bottom? And Cush historically has been called Cush, and today we call it Ethiopia. Now, the word Havilah is a little bit different, and that is the name of one of the kids of the descendants of, uh, of the genealogies in, in, in Genesis. And so we see that other one running through the land of Egypt and down to the uh, other part of Ethiopia, the other one running down to the edge of Ethiopia. So those are some of the areas that we see, and it, it appears that um, those may be uh, areas that those rivers may have run through. Now we have another one, I think, with two slides side by side. And wh when you, you see this, we're going to take those and we're going to go back to the other one. If, if you look at that red line and you, you see it go through Egypt, down to Ethiopia, and then it branches off and you see one red uh, line going further north, emptying out, and then the other one uh, coming out to the side and circling around. Now, if we go back to that bigger uh, slide, which is the green one, which shows the Horn of Africa. Now, the two things that I want to point out here is there are some things that we call rifts. Has anyone heard of a rift? And what a rift is, there is the, uh, the Jordan Rift, and this is called the, uh, the Ethiopian Rift here. And part of the rift is called the East African Rift. And if you look at that, you, you can see where apparently there was a river that flowed through that rift that made a delta in the light green that emptied out into the, uh, the Red Sea. Does everybody see that? Now, there's no river there today. But it appears that at one time there was one there. And it emptied out in that area that you see. Now, was that the ancient river, one of the ancient rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden uh, into those areas? Conjecture, some people believe it is. But here's something that you can get your mind around. The Bible refers to, in the area of Jerusalem, the Gihon Spring. Has anyone ever heard of that? So the Gihon Spring is in that area of the Jordan Rift. So if we had a topographical map of Israel, you would see on one side the landmass of what we would know as Israel. Then you would see the Jordan Valley, 
where the Jordan River runs down, and on the other side you would see a land area. And so the, the, the Jordan Rift was a place that was separated at one time that we believe geologically then moved back together in that area. And so if we go back a couple of slides, we're going to see that that red line flows down from what we call the Garden of Eden through Israel. And many people believe that that was the river that connected down all the way down to what we call the, the Gulf of uh, uh, Aqaba or the, the, the Red Sea there. And, but that now is closed off. And part of the area that's closed off is called what? The Dead Sea. Because now it has no outlet. So what most geologists believe that that area was open and it, it did flow. And then when it got closed off, that water got trapped there. And so there was an inlet, but there was no outlet. So everything flowed into it, nothing flowed out of it. But they believed at one time it did flow out. And so even in Israel today, there is that area where there are springs, and they call it the same name of the river that ran out of Eden there in Genesis chapter 2, the Gihon. And so if you want to go back and research the Gihon spring, there are springs of water in the land of Israel that bear the same name of the river that ran out of the Garden of Eden. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And it's pretty interesting. Now, the reason I said that probably the world is a little different, and we do know the world has changed over large areas of time, but what timetable has that been? Has it been millions of years? Has it been thousands of years? You know, we, we don't know. If we talk to the modern-day geologists, they're going to say how long, millions of years. But there's something that happened in the book of Genesis. We'll get to it later, but I think we need to talk about it just because we're talking about these rivers. So uh, if we believe Genesis, then what did we do? We got rid of a lot of the isms, right? Because if I believe what the Word of God says in Genesis, then I, I can't be an atheist. I can't be an agnostic. Uh, you know, I, I can't be a Mormon. I, I can't be, you know, into pantheism. I, I can't be any of those things because they don't jive to the Genesis account. So if you're thinking, well, I might be this. No, if you believe what Genesis says, then it precludes you from being any of those things because they don't line up to Scripture. Is everybody okay? Okay. I'm just telling you, you can't have it both ways. Um, you know, if you're going to be in Scientology, you, you can't say, I believe the Genesis account. You have to say, we came on spaceships, you know, 75 million years ago, and that's how we got here. Okay. So um, you and uh, some of the movie stars can jail. But if we believe the Genesis account, do we believe that these things are true? Do we believe these rivers actually at one time existed? So if we go back a little bit further, then we know that most scientists and most geologists believe that the world looked a lot different. And there's a, there's a name for this, and it's the, the name Pangea. Has anybody ever heard the, the term Pangea? So Pangea is the term that is used in geology and science, that the world was connected much closer in land mass at one time in the, in the earth's history. Now let me just take a side note here, and I think you'll find this uh, amazing too. I was watching a, a documentary, uh, one of those shows about mummies. A lot of the cultures around the world mummified. And so they were looking at Egyptian mummies, and they begin to do, and we could only do this in the last 40, 50 years, they begin to do analysis of the tissues of the mummies. Uh, they, they could break it down. We, we can see, you know, some of their DNA. We can see some of the things that they ate. We can, you know, kind of determine some of the things they had in their systems and their bodies. One of the most disturbing things for them to try to unravel 
is they found that the Egyptian mummies, many of them had traces of cocaine and tobacco in them. Now here's the difficulty. is the only place in the world that there was access to cocaine was South America because it had to come from a certain plant and that plant was not in Africa and that plant was not in Europe. So the question to the scientists who discovered this in the tissues of the mummies had the quandary of how did tobacco and cocaine get in the bodies of these Egyptian mummies? So there had to be two things that had to happen. If you've ever had a puzzle of the world, if you take South America and Africa, it looks like they actually interlock together on a map that at one time they fit together. That was one theory. Another theory is that there was a trade between the continents much earlier than anyone ever, ever realized. And not only was that trade earlier, but could have been closer than we ever realized. Because this is what most believe, that this massive landmass called Pangaea broke apart and that's where we get the term continental drift, that the continents begin to drift apart. Now, there again, if we look at scientific uh, you know, thought, it was happening millions and millions and millions of years ago. But maybe not. We don't know. So let me give you a verse here, and we'll, we'll think about this here in a moment. This is Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. To Eber there were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now look at this line in this verse. In his days the earth was divided. Now, what does that mean, divided? Does it mean divided in culture? Does it mean divided in language? Uh, the, tower, the, the Tower of Babel's already happened. Uh, d does it mean in his day uh, there was some type of division? But it says in his day, the earth, not the world, the earth was what? Divided. Now, Eber is the third generation from Shem. So wh what do we know about Shem? We know that he was one of the sons of Noah that was on the ark. Ham, Shem, Japheth, right? So we, we had eight souls on the ark. We had uh, that grouping there and their wives. Then we had Noah and his wife, so you know, we, we have eight. And so third generation from uh, that time period, it says that the world was divided. So if you go back and read the, the Noah account, it had never rained. A mist came from the earth and watered all the plants and the animals. But there were, you know, we, we know there were rivers, right? We just talked about four of them. We know that there was oceans and seas. But we, we don't know how the configuration was. But now we have this verse, and it, it, it's just kind of thrown in there. You have to really look to find it. It says, but in his day the earth was divided. Now, I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I know it's in there. But we know that when the flood happened, there was rain for the first time. But it says the fountains of the deep were broken up. So we had not only an ocean or there was waters on the surface of the earth, we also know that there was a great ocean of water under the earth or below the land mass. And so as the earth broke open, then the water came forth and there was enough water to cover the earth from the atmosphere, from the rain, and from the depths that sprang up. And so we have some very interesting things going on in this worldwide flood. I was watching the show today, and they were making a reference in a documentary this morning, and they made this uh, 
account, and they said there, there's no evidence of a worldwide flood. And I'm thinking, goodness gracious, there's evidence all over the world. Because you can go up in mountains and you see shells and you see aquatic life and you see fossils of sea creatures all over the world in very high elevations. And so when some Yehu comes on television and says that, I'm thinking, what are you saying? Because that is absolutely not true. And you can go back and read, even secular people say, there are fossils of aquatic animals at very high ele uh, elevations really all over the world. So he here we have this line that says, in his day the earth was divided. Uh, we don't know exactly what that means. And some say, well, that, that means uh, the Tower of Babel. We were divided in language. The problem of that is that happened pre-flood. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the reason for the vision happened, uh, the, the evilness pre-flood, and then right after the flood is when they begin to, to build the, the Tower of Babel. So is it, you know, division of language? Is it division of cultures? Is it division of continents? I don't know, but I know the earth was divided according to Scripture. So the earth that we know today is very much different than the world that was created by God. There has been a transformation, there has been a shifting, there has been a movement, and these two rivers that we have, the Gihon and the, the Pison, we, we cannot identify them today. But the other two, we can identify, the Tigris and Euphrates. So those are not some made-up rivers, they're still going on today. So it's very interesting, when you look at the book of Genesis, there's so many things that if we just stop and think about it and we begin to analyze it, it really gets deeper and deeper and deeper as you look at it. And hopefully you've seen that through uh, what we've talked about tonight. Now let me end on this. Uh, not only was the earth divided in this time right around the flood, but we see the, the culture, the, human, the humanity, the relationships uh, begin to develop. In the next chapter, chapter 4, I believe it is, we're going to see that Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. We see the results of sin because now we have the first human death. We have no human death until this time. And it's when Cain kills his brother Abel. We see the sacrificial system continue on because we see both of them are bringing sacrifices to God. We know that Abel brought an animal sacrifice to God. Cain brought a, what we would call an agricultural uh, crop type sacrifice to God. Why does God seemingly prefer one over the other? I think we might see the reason in that Abel had watched his father sacrifice. And the reason that Abel is sacrificing animals is because I think uh, uh, Adam is sacrificing animals and Abel is sacrificing animals is because God saw, uh, uh, Adam saw God sacrifice an animal. Because what clothed their nakedness? It was an animal skin. And animals don't give up their skin without being sacrificed. So the animal sacrifice was not started under the Mosaic law. The animal sacrifice was started by God covering the nakedness of man. And the reason he covered the nakedness of man is because of the sin of man. So Genesis tells us that our sin needs to be covered. And guess what? Thousands of years later, Jesus Christ went to the cross because our sins needed to be covered. And it wasn't a temporary covering that Jesus gave us. It was an eternal covering. And he covers us by his blood and his sacrifice. Because he's the lamb, the true lamb of God that was slain. But in this time, we, we see the beginning of the animal sacrifices. And God told Cain, he said, you know, if you bring the right thing, if you do the right thing, he said, don't worry, you'll be accepted. But we see he got bent out of shape. He got angry. He killed his brother Abel, 
And uh, we have the line there that becomes famous, and some people don't even know where it came from. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, l let's play a little uh, twist to that line. You want to? If we go back to the beginning of Genesis, we know God created mankind. We didn't come through evolution, right? So if we go to a monkey in the zoo, he does not say, am I my keeper's brother? Some of you will get that later. but So we are not evolved from the animals. We are created in the image of God. And uh, we, we have a higher purpose and a higher creative level because we're created, what, in the image of God. Nothing in the creation that we know of in the cosmos or on the earth that was ever set up that it was created in the image of God. That's why you are so unique and you are so special because of all the things God ever created, only you were created in the image of God. And that ought to make you feel a lot better tonight. Don't get the big head. Don't get prideful. But you and I are created in the very image of God. So when Jesus Christ came to this earth as a baby in Bethlehem, he didn't have to say, I want to look like them because we already look like him because we were created in the image of God.